Okay, so I want to address uh, one particular comment. I might go over just these real briefly, but I want to keep this short. Um, so uh, this is in reference to this video here. Here is the sequence where I try to lay it out very simply. I try to show what others are, are saying and how messed up it is. And then I try to make it very simple about the sequence of the end time. All right, so in that video I make reference to um, the fact that nobody has ascended to heaven and in the context of that I was speaking about how I would hear preachers say that well their loved one is up in heaven watching over us now and I don't believe that at all now the issue is uh, about soul sleep and uh, so that's the context of the conversation. Now, um, Jesus is author and finisher of our faith, um, has a little criticism for me, which I want to encourage criticism, uh, positive criticism, all right? Not the, the vain criticism that, like, say, 10 years ago when I was talking about the Bible, uh, you know, I get a lot of comments uh, where it was just simply somebody saying, you're dumb, or maybe even much worse than that. They might have even used foreign languages that I wasn't aware of. I think I learned a few curse words too. But they would, this, that sort of vain criticism does nobody no good, right? So, you know, people saying, well, you need to be institutionalized okay that's great but that doesn't really do anything for me you know people saying well you need to you know take medication yeah that's great man yeah but that doesn't do anything for me so when I say I want criticism I want it I want positive criticism okay you think I'm wrong I'm okay with that but tell me what I got wrong, okay? And so uh, this fella here, uh, he states what he thinks I got wrong, and that's fine. Um, and of course, seeking Susan or however you say that, Susan agrees. Now reading through this, and perhaps uh, you know, I want to be fair. So let me read this comment here and then address it because I'm going to tell you uh, it's not, I, I'm, I agree with what is being said. What I don't agree with is the idea that souls have ascended to heaven. And so let first of all let's uh, read the comment here. It says, hey brother, sorry it took a few days. Um, it was about when we pass on that we soul sleep in which scriptures are clear, we do not. Uh, in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7. If I'm saying that word wrong, let me know. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it now that's great okay I think if I remember right um, I thought Susan all right no Susan uh, actually addresses another verse okay so let's address this real, real quickly I want to point something out here just because I like to make distinctions I like to define and make clear things Hebrews 412 for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts 
and intents of the heart. So right here I'm using this scripture as an example that there's a difference between a soul and a spirit. Okay, oops. And I think that's important because, uh, you know, uh, people say, um, you know, I get the impression, let's put it that way, that when people talk about soul sleep, they're talking about their spirit doesn't sleep. Okay, well, as I pointed out with, um, you know, like the, the thief on the cross, uh, you know, does his soul immediately go to um, be with the Lord, I guess, right? Or uh, what was the other example that I used? Uh, maybe it was uh, the beggar and the rich man. I don't recall now. I apologize. I don't recall. But either way, um, there's a difference between the spirit and the soul. Now, if you take like the thief on the cross, for example, um, Jesus says, this day will you be with me in paradise. Now, Jesus that day ascends to heaven. The thief on the cross does not. All right. It's like uh, when Lazarus. Okay, there's another example. It gets a little confusing because there's two different Lazarus. Two different fellows named Lazarus. But when, when Lazarus was dead. Let's see. Our friend Lazarus. Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep okay I was gonna make this real short but now it's gonna turn it along but I'll try to make this quick all right so how be it Jesus spake of his death but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep when in fact he was dead okay so uh, there should be no dispute here that the reference to Lazarus being asleep was in reference to him being dead now if okay so consider this Lazarus is he saved or is he not saved okay because if he's saved then this idea that he's already ascended to heaven or resurrected or as or whatever um, is if he's already with the Lord then why would the Lord come and take him away and bring him back to life? All right, so it's a little bit of a semantics, right? So I strongly contend that when it says no man has ascended to heaven, Jesus means no man has ascended to heaven. No man has resurrected from the dead. There are not our loved ones looking over us. It it sounds great and it comforts us thinking oh my loved ones watching over me right now but I believe that's witchery or witchcraft it's uh, it's not it, it just doesn't ring true to me at all okay that this idea that we got spirits uh, you know what you know what walking among us uh, hiding in the closet under our bed I, I don't know I don't get it but I don't believe that at all. Don't believe that at all. I believe the soul. When you say like, uh, I'm not sure if this fellow says it. Uh, S Susan says it. Soul sleep. So that's why I wanted to point out a difference between the soul and the spirit. And I don't believe at all that when you die, you have any conscious at all. And there's a verse. Oh my goodness. I should have been prepared for this. Hold on a second. Just give me a second here. Something just came to my head here. I don't know if I can find it or not. If I don't, then I'll have to move on.
No, I don't remember where it's at. I'll have to come back to it. I don't remember where it's at. I kind of wish I did. I kind of wish I could remember stuff. There's something about when we die, there is no knowledge. Uh, because essentially the book is closed. Oh my goodness, I can't believe. I cannot remember. Uh, let me try two things here real quick. Uh, right there. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not any thing. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. All right, so that's the verse I was looking for. Okay. To me, that says that when you're dead, your book is closed. That's it. And the book will not get opened again if you consider your life a book. And when you die, that book is finished. And then on Judgment Day, those books are opened. All right, so <clears throat> there's not... It, a loved one right now is essentially sleeping they are not wandering about in the air or in the ground they're asleep just like Lazarus was asleep and Jesus Jesus pulled him out of his sleep and of course there's Old Testament uh, what was that Samuel I don't remember now I don't want to look at it but I wanted to make this real short okay so let's look Let's continue to read this because I'm, what I'm going to say is that he's not wrong. It's just how are we perceiving um, these verses and uh, the what's the word I'm looking for? The discernment between it or the difference between uh, the spirit and the soul. So let's continue. What was I reading here? Ecclesiastes. I see that's a great book, isn't it? Ecclesiastes 12 then shall the dust return to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it when scriptures talk of sleep it's the flesh and the spirit moves on alright uh, no because I just showed you the verse and uh, John 11 that clearly did not speak of I'm not sure. Maybe he's not disagreeing with me. Okay. If he sleep, he shall do well. But he was dead, right? Right. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought he had spoken. Okay. So maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit. Here, let's go back. When scriptures talk of sleep, it's the flesh. The spirit moves on. Okay. Jesus went and spoke to the spirits in prison. Okay. So here we go. Now I've heard this. Now I don't agree with this. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was uh, preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by waters. Now the problem, the issue I got with this, is I've heard people say, First Peter three. Where am I at here? I've heard people say, well, you know how like uh, Mormons believe that you can pray for the dead and the dead will be saved. All right. And that, I mean, aside from being lunacy, I, I think of that as sort of like witchcraft. I don't know if there's a proper, uh, proper uh, you know, religion you know to uh, attach that to or what have you where am I in here first Peter 3 alright but I mean that's the idea that's the idea in my mind uh, so we go to first Peter 3 for Christ also has suffered once for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit 
by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. All right, so there is no mention, no suggestion, no implication that this is talking about dead people. All right, we know that Jesus will uh, has made himself known um, to uh, both the living and the dead. All right, but um, first of all, have to establish this. You, I don't see a difference between uh, like an earthly prison and you know what people have suggested a prison that what of unsaved people in the belly of hell I don't know but that's the suggestion that I've heard and I don't agree with okay but um, to suggest okay to go along with this idea of no soul sleep would be to say okay there's a prison in heaven or there's a prison in hell and what Jesus went down and preached to unsaved people or Jesus went to a prison in heaven I don't see I can't go along with that I don't I think that he just preached to people in prison on earth now correct me if I'm wrong here because I haven't really studied that very much I just given you a general idea how I don't I can't go along with the idea that this is talking about a prison in heaven or a prison in hell and Jesus went to dead people and preached to them uh, you know he no doubt made himself known but to say that he went and saved dead people I don't believe that at all so John was in prison got his head cut off all right so anyways uh, I was gonna make this short to make a short video long let's continue all right uh, let's see and also the trans Figuration of Moses and Elijah shows spirit moves on as well as this. Okay. All right, and then also the the rich man and the beggar. Okay, that's Luke 16, I believe. Right? Yeah. All right. So both of those are examples. Okay. So first of all, um, in the Moses and Elijah. Uh, appearance they appeared in spirits and there's no mention of uh, these spirits being anything more than spirits okay there's no mention of them being resurrected and there's no mention of them being in heaven when this occurs you like how I'm implementing this uh, new voice that uh, that oh it's a light light uh, I was listening I was I did a video yesterday where the guy's talking all goofy and he's got this way of speaking and you know it's great I think it must be attractive to people you know you you talk with authority or you kind of sing song quality and it gets people's attention I, I don't know I can't <laughs> I can't do it with a straight face I really can't but it's I guess for some people it's probably cool it sounds religious all right who cares all right so uh, and then there appeared Eliza Elias which is Elijah with Moses and they were talking with Jesus and uh, then the question should I make three tabernacles and no 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 okay all right where are we at here oh yeah 
was going too far. Okay, so um, if we go here, and he was transfigured before them. Okay. Now, the, my point here is that there's no um, suggestion that these that Elias. Elias and Moses, Elijah and Moses, were in their resurrected bodies. No mention or suggestion that they came down from heaven. All right, and why this is so important is because Jesus says in John 3, verse 13, no man has ascended into heaven. And also, I'll point out that in Acts 2, oh, is it 19? I don't know. I could be making stuff up. It says, for David himself has not ascended to heaven. Thirty-four, For David is not ascended to heaven. So why would Moses and Elijah ascend to heaven, but not David? All right. So now you want to say, okay, the spirit has not died. I'm with you all the way. But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go along with the idea that the spirit goes up into heaven and is watching over us. I don't. I you know the spirit is with God. I'll go with that for sure. When we are born of the spirit of God. We have everlasting life. The Spirit of God will never depart from us. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. There's no way the Spirit can depart from us when we are born of God, when we are born of the Spirit of God. No way. The exception, or the what I take an ex uh, exception to, is the idea that we our loved ones are running around like ghosts watching over us and you know knocking over a, a, a you know a coffee cup or something and telling us not you know that's enough coffee or whatever you know I you know I don't know I don't know what why that's so important um, for people to think well my loved one is not in hell so they must be in heaven when the Bible is very clear that nobody has resurrected and there's a judgment day it is appointed unto once it is is it is appointed unto man once to die and after that judgment all right so considering that then okay so if our loved ones did go to heaven or hell and are there right now while we're still alive then they the judgment for them has already come and that's that's not in the bible the judgment is when the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the clouds of heaven. That's when judgment is made. And so right now, if you are born of the Spirit of God, the Spirit will never depart from you. All right, you're essentially sealed, secure, sanctified forever. Now, the resurrection does not happen until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. So, uh, I, there's not two resurrections. There's not a constant, ongoing judgment. So, if you're saved right now, that doesn't change when you die. There's not all of a sudden a judgment, okay, you're saved when you die. You're saved right now. The judgment is the resurrection when we are changed 
in the twinkling of an eye. First, the dead in Christ shall rise. Now think about that. The first, the dead in Christ shall rise. If they're already up in heaven, where are they rising to? Right, when Jesus comes down, descends from heaven, we ascend up in the air to be with him. We're not descending to be with us that are alive and remain. You get what I'm saying? All right, so I think um, this is something that's worth talking about because I actually, I kind of think we all agree that the Spirit never dies. That we have everlasting life, the Spirit of God, He abides in us and we abide in Him. And so the issue I have is these people that are saying um, our loved ones have already resurrected gone up to heaven and are watching over us that's not true at all that's the issue I have okay so all these verses to be absent from bodies to be present with the Lord this is speaking of spirit all right which again that's why at the very beginning I pointed out a difference between soul and spirit for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Right. Spiritually, far better because we are in a sense trapped in this flesh right so we are strangers in a strange land and in a strange body and our hope is in a better land in a with a better body right very clear that our souls does not sleep and those who are saved go to God all right so this is where I think that the difference is. I, I believe what you're meaning when you say that is you're talking about the spirit and not the soul. All right. Uh, the, uh, to me, maybe you disagree. To me, that's what I'm seeing. When you share these verses, I'm seeing the spirit being talked about and not the soul. All right, and there's another verse here in, I think, Matthew 6. Uh, let me think about it. Fear God. Uh, fear Him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. It's Matthew 10. I was way off. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell when does this happen does this happen immediately when your loved one dies and they're not saved is their body is their soul destroyed their body died but is their soul destroyed is there a constant destroying of souls right now or is the judgment of God when the destruction of all the unsaved souls occur now I'm going to tell you look man it's it's when Jesus comes in the clouds the great day of the Lord judgment day that is when the souls of the unsaved are destroyed and again, on such the second death has no power. This parallels what we just read, where when we are saved, we are secure forever. And the judgment of God, which we read about here, from 12 to 15, this is when uh, those books are opened and judgment is made, and those who are not saved are destroyed. Those of us who are saved right now, we have the Spirit of God. We are born of the Spirit of God. 
and it will never die. And the second death, which occurs on Judgment Day, will have no effect on us at all. All right, blessed is he that has part in the first resurrection, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the first, and he has promised to come back to gather us to be with him. On such, the second death has no power, and that's upon his return when judgment is made and finalized and everything is going to be new all right when he comes in the clouds he will gather his elect from one end of heaven to the other another example is in revelation the saints who are martyred are waiting on the ones still to come all right where's that at where's that okay so i know what you're talking about but um let's okay let's do this here let's do this let's go this um, you'd probably like me to go to Revelation but um, I also want to go to another verse here There it is. Okay. I tell you, okay, so let's open this up. Luke 18, verse 8. And the Lord said here, okay, so I could go over all this, and probably I should, but I'm not going to. And But it says, hear what the unjust judge said, because this woman, here, let's read the whole thing, shall we? Why not? Make a short video long. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest her by her continual coming she weary me her continually nagging me to death about this thing she's gonna wear me out she wearing me out woman so and the Lord said hear what the unjust judge saith and shall not God avenge his own elect which cried day and night unto him though he bear long with them I tell you that he will avenge them speedily nevertheless when the son of man cometh shall he find faith on earth to me the uh, what's very interesting here is the question will he find faith on earth to me this is consistent all throughout the bible where uh, there is uh, a growing desolation of believers if you will things are getting worse and worse and worse you think of um, when Noah prepared the ark how many people were saved only eight remember when uh, was Abraham that pleaded if there are ten uh, what is that What is that? Uh, what am I thinking of here? Uh, hey, I'm going to find it. Hold on a second. Oh my goodness. Maybe I'm not going to find it. No, I'll find it right. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Will thou destroy? See here, ah, oh, it's Genesis 18, right there, talking about Sodom. All right, so this is great, a great example because, uh, you know, basically Abraham is pleading with God, hey, look, man, you're gonna destroy the. What if there's saved people in there? What if there's 50 of them? We, we spare it. 
And God says, okay, if there's 50, I'll spare the city. But no, there wasn't 50, was there? And Abraham, he's like, wow, well, you know what? This place is wicked. There might not be 50. Let's, let's bargain here. He bargains all the way down to 10. And there was not 10, was there? There was not 10 righteous at all in Sodom. So God destroyed it. All right, that's the moral of the story. There's none righteous, but this place was exceptionally wicked. Uh, there should be no dispute about that. All right, so I just wanted to um, make that comparison. Before Noah, there was only eight saved. During the time of Sodom, there wasn't even ten saved. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, will there be even ten people saved on earth still alive? And I think that's a great question. Okay, so I kind of think I went off topic a little bit, but come on, that's interesting stuff. So if um, if we go, uh, see, I want to go back to uh, I want to go back to uh, Matthew 24, except those days shall be shortened, no flesh shall be saved, Mark 13, except those days be shortened, no flesh be saved, okay, so the idea is, is things are getting worse and worse and worse and worse, all right, that's, that should be crystal clear in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, so what was I talking about here in reference here, all right, the martyred souls, okay, so let's go back to the martyred souls of uh, what was it revelation 6 or i forgot my place already so I went backwards and then i turned sideways and now i'm going forward and so let's see what we got here revelation 6 verse 10 and when he had opened a fifth seal i saw under the soul and i saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of god and for the testimony which they held and they cried with a loud voice saying how long O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes are given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, and tell their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Uh, then the sixth seal is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's parallel to what we read in Matthew 24 verses 29 through 31 alright when the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken alright this is equivalent exactly parallel all you have to do is connect the dots and you'll see the sixth seal is Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. And be, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. You cannot in your right mind make the argument that this is a different event. It's the same doggone thing. All right. And the reason why I emphasize that because there are so many people who are teaching this as a different event. They're not able to connect the dots. They're standing behind a pulpit in front of a large congregation of people, yet they don't have any understanding whatsoever of the end times events, which is very, so very simple to understand and to see. Well, so why don't they see it? Why are they not able to connect the dots? It's the same doggone thing. This is not another tribulation dispensational event. It's the same thing, man. Connect the dots. Okay. Now, 
I get down off my pulpit and let's continue. All right, what was I talking about here? All right, so the sixth, that's the sixth seal. The fifth seal is the time period that we're going through right now, right? And so um, the, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Okay, so under the altar to me does not at all suggest they, that they are above the altar that they're not in heaven they're not alive nor resurrected and that they uh, they're not wandering about and this does not conflict with anything else that's in the Bible alright and when we get down here as that they should be killed as they were should be fulfilled all right when this all comes to an end is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and we are all resurrected just as we read in Daniel 12 and I don't believe Daniel got it wrong don't believe that at all many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt this is talking about the end of the world this is crystal clear there can be no dispute about it that's the end of the world that's what Daniel's talking about and so when it says many of them that sleep in the dust that that sleep is not you know snoring sawing logs that sleep is they're being dead all right now again those of us that are born of God born of the Spirit of God those of us that are saved the Spirit of God is with us and we are in it forever that does not change that never departs from us whether we're asleep or awake all right so in a sense I think that uh, we really don't have that big of a difference of opinion it's more semantics on how we're defining the soul and the spirit all right that's what I think. Now I want to encourage um, this conversation because I'm not, I'm not in any way going to suggest that somebody's going to hell because they got a different opinion than I do. I think it's good to talk about differences, and this is this is a sort of an interesting subject. I really believe that, and I, you know, I. I can't imagine anybody getting that upset with me because I have a different opinion than them. But, you know, people get upset with me all the time. What do I know? And I have a, a, a fault of mine that uh, I barely care. Uh, I, all I want is the truth. If you have to get mad at me, that's okay. If you can teach me something, that's great. Man, you know, I've been wrong so many times in my life. I want to know, you know. I want to know what's true right and that's all I care about I, I don't want to be a fool I've been a fool I played the fool most of my life and really and um, you know I, I just want to know the truth that's all all right because and then uh, there's an interesting comment there that the gentleman made. If we can go back to it here. Um, we all don't know everything. And the Lord has his reasons for this. That's true. But. Okay. To me this is interesting. We don't know everything. Yeah, that's. Boy. I wish I could know everything. I bet you're the same way, right? I wish I could know everything. Well, God has promised us that we can know the truth of whatever it is that we ask. All right? Um, let's go to, what was it, Matthew 5 or 6 or somewhere in the Bible it says um, something. I don't know what it says. 
The Bible says something. I know it does. I guarantee it does, doesn't it? For everyone that asks receiveth, and he that seeketh find, and to him that knock it shall be opened. All things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Everyone that asks receives, and he that seeketh find, and him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now, uh, in John, where am I at here? Here thereto, hitherto, have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Now let's go here. First uh, John, chapter four, verse six. We are of God. He that knoweth God hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I fully believe that we can know the spirit of truth and also know the spirit of error. We can know the truth. And God will guide us to all truth. We go back to John. What is that word? Guide? Is that the right word? How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Not some truth, but all truth. So I think we can know all the truth of whatever we're searching, whatever we're seeking. What we can't know is all things about everything. Not now, anyways, in this flesh. There is just too much to know. There is just way too much to know. We can't know it all, but we can know certain things. Whatever we want to know. we can. There's just so much to know. It's impossible to know it all. That's what I believe. And think about this verse here. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. And I think about that. There's just so much that could be written. There's so much that could be known. There is no, it's as if there's no limit at all when it comes to knowledge. So whatever it is that you desire to know, that you seek to know, you can know the truth of it. Okay, does that make sense? All right. So, I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I... Um, also sort of kind of want to you know put a caveat to that to say that hey you can know whatever it is that you wish to know that you desire to know it's possible and I don't want anybody to take that defeatist mindset that well hey I don't know you know can Jesus save us I don't, I don't know well, why did Jesus die well I don't know we just can't know why well, I, you know that we can know why Whatever it is that we wish to know, we can know why and what you know what the purpose is and all that sort of stuff. Don't give up on stuff so easily, right? Just because you don't know it, you can seek it out, search it, and find it. All right. All I know is I trust Him and love Him more than anything. I stumble in word, thought, and deed daily, as do I. Pretty evident pretty obvious I think but uh, yeah again it happens to everybody again I apologize if I did criticize I feel off I want you to criticize now I what I don't want is you to call me stupid tell me to take my meds and go seek help and get institutionalized and um, don't forget your stray jacket right that's that doesn't do me any good all I want to do is if you have a different opinion, I want to 
know what your different opinion is, why you believe that, and then have a discussion about it. And let me talk about it. And by talking about it, this will help me. And maybe it'll help somebody. I don't know. But it helps me when people criticize me. It helps me to, you know, to uh, uh, study it out and to consider it and to discern it and all that sort of stuff. Examine it and uh, and so forth. So I appreciate the criticism, you know, when it's positive, like you demonstrated right again call me ugly and stupid and you know all that sort of, I already know I'm ugly and stupid and that doesn't do me any good I'm not gonna gain anything when you call me ugly and stupid I already know it it's like uh, I played softball last year you know I'm a little bit older than than most of those guys playing softball well, one of the guys on the other team, they called me an asshole. They did it. And I I was like, you know, kind of put my hands up and looking around. I walked up to the to the umpire and I said, "The guy called me an asshole." I already know I'm an asshole. Right? What's the point of that? I, I don't understand, you know. I already know that. I already knew that. What's the point? And he's mad, you know, he's getting all mad and everything, fussing and cussing. I'm having fun. Maybe he's right, you know, but I already, I mean, he is right, right? I already know it. But I don't want to be unfair. All right, so uh, to, I guess, to clarify, in that situation, I, I felt that the, those guys were being unfair because they were not abiding by the rules. All right, so we're playing co-ed softball, and if you know anything about co-ed softball, you cannot bat three men in a row. You can't do it. All right, we didn't do it. That's against the rules to do it. If you bat two guys in a row, there's an out in between. All right, so that what they did is they batted three guys in a row. I said, look, if I get this guy out, that'll be five outs. All right. Well, so I ended up walking the guy. And then that just threw them for a loop. Because they were trying to figure out, five outs, what's he talking about? So I walked the guy on purpose. And then, of course, because I did that, I'm an asshole. All right, okay. That's all right. I already, you know, that was kind of my intention. Look, if you guys are going to be unfair, I'm going to do this. Of course, the rule is, now, if I walk a guy, the girl takes first base, the guy goes to second. Well, they were so confused about what was going on. Because they were not being fair. They were not being honest. They just said, go ahead and we'll bat the girl. They declined the free base for the girl. Well, who cares, right? The point is, man, the criticism, that's fine. I don't, you know, he called me names. He can get mad at me. Fuss and cuss and all that sort of stuff. But I appreciate this sort of positive criticism, you know, where you show what you, you, you have a different opinion, and you show what that different opinion is, and you use scripture to support that idea. That's positive criticism. Calling me names and fussing and cussing, that's okay. That's all right. But it's not doing me any good. It's not doing you any good, you know. So, uh, again, I appreciate it. I just want to make that clear. I want to encourage people to challenge me on these things. It'll help me. Hopefully, it'll help you. And, uh, you know, and it'll help us to grow in faith. And really, isn't that what we're here to do? Not just to preach the gospel, the good news. To everybody and, and and mostly to the unsaved right we want to help the unsaved know the gospel to know that they have an, a, an a, a scapegoat from this wicked world and that this wicked world is coming to an end we want them to know that and understand that the Lord Jesus Christ can save us from the wickedness of this world not only that but we want to grow amongst one another in faith 
We want our faith to be strengthened. We want to encourage one another because it's a guaranteed lock that Jesus Christ is real and that he will be coming in the clouds of heaven and we will be resurrected at the end of the world. We will be resurrected into our everlasting uh, bodies, our glorified bodies. We will be changed from corruptible to incorruptible. There will be no more sorrow, no more pain, and no more death. All those things are going to be done away with. That's a guaranteed lock. And, also, and I'm telling you, it's a guaranteed lock that we'll find out that the King James Bible is the pure word of God in the English language. If you have faith in the Bible you hold in your hands, if you believe it truly is from God, and it truly is from God, it'll strengthen your faith and your eyes will be open and you'll understand whatever it is you desire to understand. You'll see the truth, whatever truth that you're looking for, you'll find it, guarantee it. But if you don't have any faith, you won't find any truth and you won't have any understanding whatsoever. All right, so to make a, a short video long, even longer, let's just scroll through a couple of these comments and I think I'll end it. All right, so again, I don't want you to think I'm going to challenge me. Who do you think you are, Buster? No, 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 no. I want the criticism, the positive criticism, just like you've done. All right. And the oh, this is, yeah, this is it. They all talk to say, I can't remember. I don't remember how he's talking now. Just goofier than dog do. Just goofier than dog do. Uh, the... What was that? Uh, the millennial. The, I think it was the millennial rain guy. He talks like he's been to school and he knows what to do and how to talk. And what do you do? Put down his video. Is this it right here? Yep, there he is. He got the cool red hair. You gotta admire the clean cut look, you right? Out to its full, and Christ is the victor. He is going to bring the wrath of God to the wrath of God to an end. And the third way to an end. You got, I think it's the end. When you talk, you got to say yeah, the last letter with the, uh, the authority. You know, I, I have to practice that. Isn't that cool? I mean, I think if, peop if I talked like that, more people would consider what I'm saying. But I can't talk like that. I can barely talk normal, let alone like this. But anyways, you know, I think they are trained to, to talk like that. I don't know. I don't know. But I got a big problem with Bible college. For one, you're going to tell me a 19-year-old snot-nosed kid who gets trained to parrot what they teach in Bible college forever knows more than I will ever know? I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that at all. But that's what the impression that these people give oh well this guy went to bible college when he had snot nose when he was a snot nosed little brat he went to bible college therefore for the rest of his life he has authority over you bull butter i believe that if you have a bible that you hold in your hands and you believe that bible that you hold in your hands you have as much knowledge and access to as much knowledge and wisdom and understanding as anybody else I firmly believe that. That's, no, I'm not even. I'm very adamant about that. That's. I'm not iffy on that at all. You're not. You're a 19 year old snot nosed kid. Your parents are probably paying for your Bible college, and you're probably not believing anything they're teaching. And the teachers probably don't believe what they're teaching. They're just parroting what was parroted to them. <clears throat> and there's Bible verse to support that. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse. And worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
You're telling me that there's no deception in these Bible colleges? Come on. I ain't believing that. Come on now. All right. Convoys. Love that. Love that song. That was cool. When I was a kid, that was a cool song. I wanted to be part of a convoy. You know, have a bunch of people driving. And nobody can stop us. Not, not Smokey or anybody. Jerry Reed. You know, the Jerry Reed and uh, Burt Reynolds were were pretty popular back then. I mean, they were the cool guys, right? And, uh, and again, Susan uh, supports this idea that um, their souls don't sleep. Okay. And so, if, if again, I think that if we, it's one of these things where I think if you look at it as um, the spirit never dies, I'm with you all the way, 100%. But again, I think that's the just the difference. That's really what I think the dif the difference is in the wording. Correct me if I'm wrong. I agree with you that the spirit never dies, and we, when we become one with the spirit of God, we the spirit of God is in us, and we are in the spirit of God, and that never changes. The Spirit of God will never depart from us, and we will never depart from the Spirit of God. Never. Not when we die, not ever. When we are born, we are born forever. We are forever in the Spirit of God. However, when our body dies, we are not resurrected. Our books are closed, right? Our books are closed when our body dies, and the book is not opened again until the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the clouds of heaven first the dead in Christ shall rise and then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord okay so anyways I appreciate these comments look if you want to call me dumb and stupid and ugly that's fine I don't I don't care but I really do appreciate these co these uh, comments where you present a different view and uh, you know sort of challenge me because when we have different ways of looking at things this is how we strengthen one another as iron sharpens iron so one man sharpens another man's countenance all right so i want to encourage you all to challenge me call me bozo the clown and then chat me and then show me what you think is wrong okay i don't care but i do appreciate uh, the comments for sure. Good day.